I took some notes, I made some measurements, and I jotted down some considerations before starting building this radio. These are what I have recorded here in this video. Here just a short list of books and other sources of information. Crystal Radio, History, Fundamentals and Design, Anderson Kinsey, 1996. A workshop in German by Mandel, 2012, Detector Empfänger. A book, Radio That Works for Free, Edwards, 1977, The Voice of the Crystal, Friedrichs, 1999, and other source of information. To the left, the radio I built, to the right, the schematics. The schematics are off a project which was called the Boy Scouts Crystal Radio. I modified it, so I just removed the boy part, as I think that is more um, aligned to the zeitgeist. It's a Scouts Crystal Radio, modified because the original schematics did not include loose coupling. We have the capacitor, the variable capacitor, 365 pico farad and then in the tuned circuit we have a coil 90 turns of 22 gauge that's 0 0.6 millimeters for me i then worked out that these are 222 micro henry the spacing between the tuned coil for the, the tuned circuit and the coil along the antenna ground system. I did not find this in the original schematic, of course, because it uh, was not included there, but I found reportedly a quarter of an inch to an eighth of an inch spacing to be working, and those are an equivalent of five millimeters or two dot three millimeters for me. The coil along the antenna ground system are 25 turns, of 24 gauge, that's around uh, half a millimeter for me. The germanium diode. And the connection for the high impedance earphone. And the connection for the antenna and ground, which run to the coil, which is along the antenna ground system and the antenna ground system is separated from the rest of the radio and is not in any way electrically in contact. These are two separate circuits. That begs the questions, how much wire do I need? I did some math and I measured that for 25 turns, that's about half a meter of wire, and for the 90 turns, those are about one and a half meter of wire. So I took the circumference and I multiplied that by the number of turns, and I got my my length of wire. And then uh, the question, uh, what about uh, the antenna? How long should that be? And reportedly, uh, 15 meters of antenna should be sufficient. Uh, we'll have to investigate uh, the antenna length. There are some schematics of crystal radios illustrated here. I have them from the workshop by Mandel. What I liked is the progression in the complexity. This is the simplest way to build a crystal radio. It's just a diode with an antenna and another piece of wire to ground. And across the diode, a earpiece. That's it, nothing else. The next level of complexity would be to introduce some form of filtering, the selectivity, meaning that we would be able to, through tuning the variable capacitor, be able to sort out which is the frequency we want to receive, so which radio station we want to listen to. This works because this kind of circuit, this tuned circuit, is working as a filter. The frequency at which it resonates is blocked. So all other frequency would pass to ground and flow through this filter, this tuned circuit. But the particular frequency at which this circuit is 
tuned to resonate at is blocked. Being blocked, the energy is diverted to the diode and then to the earpiece. It acts basically as a bandpass filter. Here some values, 200 microhenry and 500 picofarad. The next level of complexity would be to remove or to detach the resistance which is caused by this part of the circuit so that it does not influence the flow of energy of the antenna ground system. So to do that, the antenna to ground wire has an inductor in series and then this inductor is placed next to the inductor of the tuned circuit. So this would be the primary which is this one here on this radio and it is in no way connected electrically to the secondary coil which is the main inductor here on the radio which is part then with the variable capacitor of the tuned circuit. There are disadvantages of course, there is some energy loss. The original schematics reported a value for the variable capacitor of 365 picofarad and 90 turns for the coil. But 90 turns, picofarad, these are completely different, different dimensions. I worked out the 222 microhenry value for the coil. I didn't have to. I wanted to. It's quite all right to follow the schematics, wind 90 times, but uh, this uh, left me curious. So I went on and worked out the value for the coil at a resonant frequency of uh, 1 megahertz, uh, and I did that for myself, and this is how I did. The value of the resonant frequency F for an LC circuit is given by the relationship F is the inverse of 2 times pi times the square root of the value of the inductor times the value of the capacity. The equation can be rearranged for C. That's what I need later, so I did that both for, for L and C. The terms are just swapped. The, they're basically the same. L is the inverse of 2 pi f squared times the capacity, and the capacity is the inverse of 2 pi f squared times the inductance. Work out the inductance, I need another tool, which is this equation, the value of the inductance is the relative permeability. In our case, the relative permeability of air has a value of 1 times the turn squared times the area. By area, this is intended, this area. That's the area over the length, and the length is the length of the windings times a constant. So turns squared are the turns of the magnet wire or Litz wire. The area can be calculated from the radius. So area is radius squared times pi. This is the area. And from the center to the edge is the radius. And we get that figure that uh, we may have to uh, report in meters. The equation wants the value in meters. The relative permeability, if the core is air, we take 1. If it's ferrite, depends. we we'll have to look that up. And the thickness of the wire in this case is not taken into account. Some considerations here as a side note. What derives from this? If more inductance is needed, a higher value of L is needed, then more turns are required or more area or a different core. I have all my tools. Now I'm ready to calculate the inductance value of my 90 turns of coil. 90 turns cover a length of 9 centimeters. I have to transform that in meters 9 times 10 to the minus 2. Anyway, here the inductance value is the relative permeability of air, we said, is 1. So that's easy. 
in this case, I calculated the number of turns. I took half of them to get a value, and I get 111 micro henries. If I take the 90 turns that my coil is made of, I will get double of that, 222 micro henry. And it works like this. The relative permeability of air is 1. And this is the radius reported in meters, uh, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared, because this is the radius and we have to square it and multiply pi to get the area. The whole thing is divided by the length in meters, which is 9 centimeters, so it's 9 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by a constant. All of that goes into the calculator and out comes our value of 220 microhenry. Now I can take those 222 microhenry, plug them into the other equation, the one rearranged for the capacity. The capacity, and I need to decide a frequency. I will take the highest frequency. Since I'm taking the highest number of turns, I will take what could be the highest frequency, 1,400 kilohertz, 1 1.4 megahertz. So I have to put that in the equation, and that goes in the f part. So capacity is the inverse of 2 pi f, which is the frequency squared times the inductance, which I have now. This is what it looks like. And you put that in the calculator, and 365 picofarad, that is what is coming out. That is what the schematics promised. And that's what's come out. There you go. Done. Just one final touch. There is a parenthesis missing here. There you go. These two parentheses. So the induction is the Relative permeability in air, which is 1 times the number of turns squared times the area over the length of the coil of the tuned circuit, multiplied by a constant. The parallel LC circuit is by no means the only possible filter combination. The LC circuit in parallel blocks uh, exhibits high impedance at the frequency at which it resonates, allowing all other frequencies to pass, uh, whereas the series LC filter uh, or LC circuit also resonates at a given frequency, but that is the only frequency which will allow to pass. All other frequencies will be blocked. The resonant frequency is given by this relationship. F is 1 over 2 times pi times the square root of the value of the inductor times the value of the capacitor. This means that the higher the values of L and C are, then the smaller the value of F, the smaller the resonant frequency is because it's inverse of. So think of it as your piece of cake, if you have 1 over 2, so half of your cake, that's as much as you have. But if you have at the denominator a higher number, say 4, you have a quarter of a cake that is obviously less than half of your cake. So what this means that the higher the number at the denominator, the lower is the frequency at which the circuit is resonant. That's what's happening when I am tuning my coil if I add inductance, if I'm adding more coil to my circuit, if I am adding more capacitance to my circuit, these numbers will be higher, the frequency will be lower. So a lower frequency will be in the medium wave, in the AM band, some five, 600, maybe as low as 400 uh, kilohertz. If I take capacitance out and I turn so that less coil is included, then these numbers will be smaller, the frequency will be higher at higher frequency, 
I will reach. One thousand four hundred kilohertz, one dot five megahertz approximately. This is what this radio should be covering. The tune circuit also stores energy. It doesn't just act as a filter. It also stores the energy coming from the signal it receives and effectively increasing the amplitude of the selected uh, AM station. Crystal radios are voltage driven. The diode or the crystal have a threshold, a voltage threshold. The earpieces require voltage. There is no external power other than that harnessed by the antenna available for the crystal radio to function. The equivalent length of an antenna wire for 1 megahertz, which is in the middle of the AM broadcast band, is 300 meters or 984 feet. Since the energy wave traveling in the antenna at resonance has its two components of voltage and current out of phase, there are shorter lengths that can be taken in consideration at a loss, though, of captured energy. Less sensitivity when the antenna length is shorter. The frequency at which an antenna is resonating at is the one at which the energy flowing along it exhibits high voltage and no current at its ends. Current is nil at its ends and the voltage is high at its ends. At the resonant frequency, the energy flowing along the antenna at both ends of the antenna has nowhere to go. So the current is nil at both ends of the antenna, whereas the voltage is high. This radio is designed in such a way that the wire that makes the antenna meets an inductor. A mechanically too short antenna can be electrically elongated by adding an inductor near the point where it is capacitive, i.e. where it exhibits high resistance and higher voltage values, i.e where it is behaving like a parallel resonance circuit. At half the antenna length, the current is low and the voltage is high. At one-eighth of the antenna length, the current is high and the voltage is high. These correspond to 37.5 meters or 132 feet, approximately 40 meters of wire length with respect to the whole 300 meters of the antenna otherwise resonating at 1 megahertz. I got it that the Antenna length should be at least 15 meters in length and have a good ground. And I also know that an inductor in series in my antenna ground system will allow me to shorten mechanically the antenna I am using. The coil placed in the right place and of the right value will allow to elongate the antenna electrically. The antenna should be at least 15 meters in length and there should be a good ground.
the approach that I have taken is to calculate the value of this inductance and then try and find out how much shorter can the antenna be with the respect of uh, the length which would correspond to the frequency it's supposed to resonate at. So that's exactly uh, what I did. Let me switch the pan of the recording to the calculation. And here it is, antenna ground primary coil. This is the system. Turns 25, that is given by the schematics which I was referring to and the radio that I built thereafter. As a side note here, the relative permeability in air is 1. The radius, as said before, is 2.5 centimeters. Those are 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. The length of the coil is 1.7 centimeters, uh, 0.017 centimeters. No, 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 meters. This is wrong. Meters. And the area is the radius of the tube around which the coil has been wound and the area is that its radius by pi. All of that goes into the equation. The inductance is the relative permeability of air. That's one, that's easy. Uh, multiplied by this part, which is the turns squared times the area over the length times a constant. All the numbers go in and the resulting inductance is 72,187 times the constant, which is given a value in Henry, which converted to micro Henry's R91. So these 91 micro Henry's are the value of the coil in the antenna ground system, which begs the question here, let me remove that from the field of view. So that begs the question, how shorter is the antenna allowed to be? or How much is that affecting antenna length? And how much can the antenna be shortened? Of course, shortening the antenna will mean that I will have less elements that will be picking up energy. So there is a trade-off there. Shorter antenna will mean higher selectivity. It will pick up stronger signals. And fainter broadcast stations will be left out on one side. On the other side, a shorter antenna will allow me to run my projects because uh, such a long antenna as would we expect from the wavelength, the corresponding wavelength would be impractical. Next would be the calculation based on this value of how much should the antenna or could the antenna be shortened to. I found a tool to help me calculate how much I can shorten an antenna when uh, an inductor of a given value is placed um, in series in the antenna ground system. Now, this equation is from an article by Jerry Hall, K1PLP, in QST, September 1974, pages 28 to 34. And the calculation is for the inductance required for a single band resonance of a shortened antenna in his case, an off-centered loaded dipole, but works with a vertical antenna as well. This is all, all this equation is, is set to solve the value of the inductor. I have the value of inductor, I calculated it. I am looking for the value of A, overall antenna length A, which is in here, in this equation here and here. This equation here is regarding the terms inductance required for resonance, natural logarithm of the frequency in megahertz, the overall 
antenna length, the distance from the center to loading coils, because the equation can also be applied to dipoles, so, and the diameter of the radiator in inches, which is the wire. So I would have to rearrange this equation for A, for the overall antenna length, for the overall antenna length. There you go. It's an antenna length. And there is a bracket missing here. The parenthesis. Bam. There you go. And a bit creative and I went on and, and started looking for for the equation already rearranged or alternatives and I found web presence from M0 UKD where this calculation is presented with a number of fields you just fill in you punch the numbers in press enter and you get your values out so it's also presented in a way in which it solves for the inductance. But playing with the values that I have, 1 megahertz for the frequency and position of the coil, meaning the distance from the feed point, which almost nothing, so I put 10 centimeters. And the wire diameter in millimeters is 0 0.5. That corresponds to the 24 gauge wire used. And I punched those numbers in, and when I put 37.5 meters, I get the 95.9 microhenry, which is very much like that number I have calculated for the inductance of the coil, which means that whoever came up with that uh, schematic with the, the loose coupling with the antenna, uh, with an inductor in the uh, antenna ground system on, on one side, had actually done some homework in calculations, or perhaps more probably through trial and error, cutting wire to the right length. And that whole thing seems to be working for an antenna length of 37.5 meters, some, uh, sure, something short of 40 meters, which corresponds to an eighth of the wavelength at uh, 1 megahertz. So this is from the loaded quarter wave antenna inductance calculator with a note. It could also be a loaded dipole, a half wave dipole for radio amateurs. It seems that radio amateurs do a lot of cutting to get their right antenna length and right values to make antenna links more practical. Twenty-five turns, twenty-four gauge, ninety micro Henry's. Further, Ninety micro Henry's at one megahertz correspond to an antenna which can be shortened in length to forty meters. The antenna ground system is electrically uncoupled from the rest of the radio. So the LC circuit and the demodulation system are not loading the antenna ground system. They're providing less influence to the energy flow in the antenna, resulting in a more efficient antenna. I found by measurement that the distance in the loose coupling, the distance between the inductor in the antenna ground system and that in the tuning demodulation system 
at a quarter of an inch provides a voltage transfer between the two systems at a ratio of one to one. Bringing the two coils closer actually showed a step up in voltage and separating the two coils more there was a loss in voltage. I decided to go for the quarter of an inch as I am looking for less influence on the antenna ground system as possible because I'm predicting to use the radio in an environment where the broadcast stations I want to receive will come in with a very weak signal. I got myself some germanium diodes, I made some measurements and I found that some had a lower threshold than others. I took the ones with the lower threshold, I tested them and I was not happy with the result. I tried the germanium diode with a higher threshold, I put that in the radio and I get better results. Obviously what that means is that one cannot just look at one component on its own. A diode, or as a matter of fact, it is a crystal radio after all, so if one is using a, an appropriate crystal, then the crystal or the diode is performing the rectification. For the half-wave rectification to occur, the rest of the circuit uh, would have to provide a load. It's, uh, it uh, remains to be seen if uh, a resistor needs to be added. The condenser is not going to be able to keep up with the high frequency of the half cycles of the carrier wave. Condensers are much better at acting as a storage of energy. Whereas the diode picks up the positive envelope, the capacitor or condenser filters the high frequency component out, leaving only the electrical signal representing the original sound. Since speakers are not responsive to high frequency, it is often possible to feed the output of the diode unfiltered directly to them. A resistor in parallel to the capacitor will influence how long it takes the capacitor to charge up and discharge. It will also allow the piezo in the earpiece to discharge the earpieces with piezo. They tend to act as a capacitor and charge up. And when they do, they don't work efficiently. The resistor helps allow them to discharge. Broadcast stations offset the waveform of the audio, the audio frequency waveform, so that it never crosses the zero line and a little offset there. Not crossing the zero line means it never becomes negative. To bring back down the waveform and align it to the zero line, it uh, remains to be seen if a load needs to be added after the diode in the circuit or if the rest of the circuit is uh, providing that little bit uh, of load, sufficient load. For that to happen, in my radio, this part of the circuit of the radio is not grounded. It's floating on its own level of voltage, which is not the same as the antenna ground system. So it's left to me to try out and see if the best solution for me is to have capacitor in parallel to the headphone or a resistor or even both, I have to try these out. What I learn is that the choice of the resistor, the capacitor and the diode will all influence each other. The ear set, the head ear, the headpiece.